How many times do I have to say yes? This is the first time we've ever been on StreamYard. Oh, no, you've been on StreamYard. Have you been doing StreamYard? I haven't. Yard? I'm doing you've been the doing Rogue StreamYards without I me? I didn't tell you. No, I have. This is the first time doing StreamYard, but I am doing one uh, when you start doing fifth in a couple of hours. So yeah. there'll be two tonight. Wow. And the deal is that uh, it's supposed to simultaneously go onto our YouTube Paloma channel and our U our Facebook channel. Uh, I, I kind of didn't know that we had a Facebook. Yeah, I, I didn't. I, I didn't either. We is, this did, a, is this a Busty Wimsett uh, special? It definitely. Yeah. This is Andrew Wimsett who keeps us honest and on time. We're not those people. Um, but you know, apparently Facebook is the place to be. We're just not there. So I don't know how it can be. Ben Dreyfus. God rest his soul. It's just <laughs> terrible what happened to him. <laughs> Ben Dreyfus uh, has always said, and he was the uh, the social media guy from Mother Jones for a long time until he retired. Um, uh, at twenty seven. At twenty seven. Yeah. yeah. Um, to do a sub stacking career, um, but he always says like uh, everyone hates Facebook. Journalists hate Facebook because they're stupid, because everyone's actually on Facebook, and that's what they should use. That's his. I uh, might be editing that. I, I mean, I don't go on Facebook. I, I'm a journalist, so I'm I'm the stupid one. Well, you're then you fit the, the bill. I actually liked Facebook for a long time till about I don't know three or four years ago. I mean, I'm gonna admit uh, admission here. Like I used to love the Facebook birthday things. Like, oh well, I'm admitting it. I don't care what he said. I don't don't look the at balloons? his face. Okay, no, 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 no. It's All impossible the, not to look at his face because no, it's twice as big as yours. Fourteen times as the size of my head. No, um. The, the comments, like all the people, happy birthday, Nancy. I remember. Blah, 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 blah. It's like this outpouring. Of, and I loved it. And I looked forward to it for about two or three years. And then, and then to me, Facebook became sort of this like airless party with the same people every time. I just don't want to be there. So You're broadcasting I, this on Facebook. You're telling people that they're I, not having a good I, time? No, listen to me. Right. There's a reason we're back on Facebook. Okay. I, I did that for a couple of years. I was wrong. Or I could be wrong. So we're back here now, and we would like to reconnect and see see what new stuff can happen on Facebook, not just the old stuff. Right? Nice new stuff. New All, stuff. Always new stuff. New make more pie. Make more. We gotta. I gotta get a make more pie. Uh, oh, a shirt or a theme hat song. Or so. Theme song. Where is my theme song? Are you, you know what is the theme song? Hey Nancy. Hey Nancy. Hey, I'm just saying, it's if a, it existed yeah. now, we'd have it. So, you it's know, true. did you just come here to listen to us just blather? No, sorry. Um, In case, uh, I know it's been a long time since Nancy has talked about Portland in any <laughs> context. Be like, wow, can you get that lady with the pies to talk more about Portland? Like Portland, she knows something about Portland. But in fact, there's more. It's victory lap season. And that's fine. Uh, because uh, Nancy's a great uh, piece for reason, the dream of the 90s. Died in Portland. Correct. Um, posted on Monday. And she's been doing a ton of media, a ton of podcasts, as uh, Paloma Media people, uh, listeners and watchers uh, know well. And we'll be doing more throughout the week. And it's great. Um, I wanted to drag you in here, which is really difficult because you live 10 feet away. Especially when you just poured us. We, we're drinking some incredible. Oh we are drinking the most incredible tequila that Andy Andy, I don't have his last name in front of me. Sorry, okay, Andy. Andy, but it's probably best that way. Um, Andy, Andy is like uh, he heard that we were, had been drinking George Clooney's Casamigos tequila, and he was like, and he's for Mexico. And he's like, dude, uh, not George Clooney. Um, <laughs> and he was like, dude, don't. What? Don't do what it. are you? What are you doing to me? And he literally left a bottle at the laundromat the next door. The Chinese laundry that is in the <laughs> first floor of my building, saying to Nancy Rommelman and the boys, which is the name of. Our, my new band, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, he was absolutely right. He's like, you're drinking that Casamigo shit. It's made in like, you know, what, New Jersey or something. No, he didn't say that. Um, but this is. It's uh, amazing. Of course, we should know the name of it, but we don't. We don't have the bottle. Drinking it. No, we don't uh, have the But bottle. we have a frontal lobotomy. Uh, anyways, uh, no, what I wanted to get you in here to talk about, because uh, the, the article is is largely uh, uh, traces the arc of, of Nancy's own. Um, it's not first person at all. You can read other Nancy things. That there are first is, there's person. a little, a little bit, bit, a little bit of first person. But it, tra it, it, it traces her arc there, which is from around 2004 to 2019. Although Correct. you went back a, a bunch Correct. during the unpleasantness, which is ongoing, um, to say the least. Um, but I was interested as someone whose family is still there, right? My, my, uh, my parents went to Park Rose High near, near Rocky Butte. My grandparents lived there. I went there twice a year. Once or twice a year, uh, every year until I was 
at least 18, been there a bunch, you know, aunt and uncle and Gresham, another one up in Washington, just like all my cousins there, micro brews, dudes with goatees, flannel uh, shirts, flannel shooting. shirts, shooting, fishing, inner tubing down the Deschutes. This is a life that I, I've known a, a long time. And, um, and I'm kind of fascinated by that. Actually, a jumping off point might be this. Um, there's a guy uh, who I don't know if I've ever actually met in person, and I don't know if you have either. I think he's based in Portland or he's based in Oregon named uh, Jeffrey St. Clair. Total lefty dude. I uh, used to work with Alexander Cockburn, um, mm. whose name wow. I pronounced like that on purpose. Well, um, what is it supposed to be pronounced like? Coburn. Um, um, but well, Then spell it that way, dude. Uh, he's dead, so be nice to him. But yeah, Cockburn, I never liked him much. Anyways, Jeffrey's an, a sweet heart of a guy, super lefty. We disagree on everything economically, big sports fan and from Portland. So we get along and have always been friendly. And when your thing posted, um, I saw him make a comment of like, yeah, you know, it wasn't it wasn't Antifa that changed Portland or whatever, you know, the the thumbnail thesis was. It was because in 1990, the median housing price was, you know, Eighty thousand dollars, and now it's five hundred thousand dollars. Priced everyone out, and it's the greedhead developers or something like that. And I don't expect to agree with Jeffrey St. Clair again, who I uh, I like, and uh, he knows the that um, on uh, economic issues. But that's actually kind of an interesting way of looking at this. Like, set the timeline not from two thousand four, but to nineteen ninety or nineteen eighty, and it's remarkable how much Portland and the spirit of of Portland, the economics of Portland, the development of Portland change. So I was wondering, you, you can reflect on that a little bit, and then I'll uh, intersperse some of my own uh, stupid in, in, Mount St. Helens eruption stories. In fact, I can. Um, I wrote a story for Willamette Week, which is the, uh, you know, one of the two alt-weeklies. used to be great. used to be one of the top 20 alt-weeklies in the, in the country. And I, I, I wrote for them for a while. I, I got to do some really interesting work for them, including a story like uh, exposing this church in quotes that was giving ayahuasca which is a hallucinogen to children i mean i think it's important like to these are the kind of stories you want to was that bring. nick gillespie giving the ayahuasca to oh, man, god damn it <laughs> no but um in, in any case i wrote a piece for them i think it was 2007 or 8 called um there goes the neighborhood race real estate and gentrification on my block nope. and i um was able i took like the uh, the like last three houses on each end of my block in Northeast Portland. And I talked to the people in each of the houses because we'd all bought at different times. And, you know, the woman across the street from me, Catherine, bought because her aunt had left her some money. She was like living in a woman's YMCA in the 80s. Her aunt left her $18,000. She bought this, you know, 3,500 square foot house. That was across the street from mine that in 2003, I paid $300,000 to. And then I talked to the, her neighbor and then he'd been, you know, it was his father's house and there had been like, you know, it had been like a residential treatment center for other dudes. And then there was the woman next to her that was like this super kind of yuppie-ish gal. And then the people next to me that paid 500000 It was an interesting sort of microcosm of how Portland had changed and when. And um when I moved into that block, it was about 70% black, 30% white. That was just the, and my husband wanted to live in that area because he'd grown up in Portland and he's like, babe, this is the best part of Portland because it's, it's so central. The housings are beautiful. Name of the neighborhood again. It's in Northeast Portland. It's like Boise Elliott or the North Williams neighborhood. And, um, the neighborhood, everybody was like super nice and super great. We had a great house and a yard and it, and it was like, and I loved and it. They're, and like, they're sort of crumbling victorians which be uncrumbled Am um I sometimes craftsmany they were also called old portland it's actually yeah. a style of house um and they were some of them were in not great shape some were fine the one thing that there was a lot of in that neighborhood at the time is every single corner had empty lots everyone and at the time when we bought our house my husband was like yeah, we if we were smart, if we had the money, which we didn't because he was building a business, um, we should buy some of these empty lots because at a certain point, they're going to be worth stuff. And man, oh, boy. oh were they? Um, anyway, my block changed. Um, you know, I was happy with the with the mix, uh, uh, economic mix, racial mix when I got there. But of course, I was, you know, part of the solution, which was we brought we brought money into the neighborhood. My husband opened a business down the street and also part of the problem because, you know, then it, it tipped over. And then, you know, within three years, it was 70% white, 30% black. And then you started having like the weird cranky neighbors that are like, well, I think we should do it this way. And it's just, you know, you realize like you nothing stays the same. Um, Nor 
do you want it no, to stay don't. the same? You right? don't want it to stay yeah. the same. And it's inevitable because the people and excuse me, the people that right now are are decrying like would that, you know, walk through the streets and shout at the homeowners saying this used to be a black neighborhood and you have killed that black neighborhood, which in a sense is true. Well, my neighborhood was a German immigrant neighborhood uh, starting at the turn of the last century. And they were there until like the 1930s when different things happened in Portland and it became more of an African American neighborhood. So, you know what, like, I don't know, maybe at, you know, uh, almost a hundred years ago, people were like, this used to be my neighborhood. That was a terrible German accent. Please uh, get Michael Moynihan the in here. Absolute worst. And I am Rommelman. I should be able to do a German accent, but apparently I'm not. Um, it's like I did in that article that I wrote, I was like, I'm not going to apologize for the world continuing to turn. The world will, uh, my parents rented a, $53 a month railroad flat in the nicest part of Greenwich Village when they were newlyweds in 1963 for $53. I would love to have that apartment. My dad um, grew up in a, a place on uh, Northeast Fargo. Oh, uh, my God. I lived one block from Fargo. Did you really? One block from Fargo, mm -hmm. dude. Um, that uh, when he was a kid, he was an outhouse in the back or whatever they mm -hmm. used to call it. Um, like they didn't have uh, plumbing. It's all set up until the late 40s or early 50s. Um and that was normal. Like, and my uh, his parents came there because of shipbuilding jobs in World War II. That's right. Uh, a lot of people came there or just like uh, sustained themselves throughout history with the lumber industry. Which even when I was a kid, everyone was just like uh, you know the red flannels and stuff. But and the red beards, like Dave Twardzik from the Portland Trailblazers uh, heyday in, in the in the seventies. But uh, logging was always going down, and there's that stinky ass uh, oh, factory yeah. across the river. It, no, it, it it always you can tell in the morning when the paper mills are running Ugh. because it's this weird smell that's the worst. sort of like kind of like rotten eggs, but not exactly. And it, it and you just know you get up in the morning, you go out your porch, and you're like, oh, okay, the paper mills, the winds are are blowing this way. Okay, it's 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 the whatever, it's the residue. It happens. There's a great. Um, episode of Portlandia, which uh, Nancy plays with in her um, uh, in her article, and it's the art for it as well. I, I've watched, we used to watch some of the episodes, probably like, a, you know, 10% of it. And, um, but there's one <laughs> where a character who's, you know, the new Portland, who are all like painting eggs on things and, and, and birds, uh, birds, putting birds on everything. Yep. And then also like giving you the life story of the, of the, of the chicken. That's <laughs> right. I, I need to know the <laughs> so, provenance of the chicken. If you haven't seen that, go to YouTube. It's so funny. Oh my God. But the one that I, that I treasure the most is someone who has some familiarity with Portland and especially that kind of like weird, how did it become this? Um, is when some of the newer Portlandia type people attempt to go inner tubing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't see that oh one. <laughs> they don't even like know how to like negotiate because this is like, every damn kid. There are plenty of other places in the country where it's you know, it's called tubing and and whatnot. But you just sort of float down stuff and big old inner tubes is great. And like you you, you get a six pack or a, I've done it. a case uh, if you're if you inner tube is shaped correctly. And like it, it turns into a debacle. It is. Uh, it's so hilarious. But one thing that made me think about this, and including the, the Jeffrey St. Clair thing. So economically, as shipbuilding and, and you know, lumber goes away, what what is uh, what do we know Portland for? Probably a lot of answers to that question, but basically Nike. <laughs> basically mm -hmm. Nike mm -hmm. in Beaverton, um, where uh, my mom lived for a long time. Other aunts and uncles lived a long time. Beaverton is an interesting. So Portland sits along the kind of intersection of two rivers, the Willamette, which is the Great River of Oregon, and the Columbia, which is the, the which Mississippi is River of, the, of river. the Pacific Northwest. Incredible. Uh, incre if you ever get a chance to go to Astoria, Oregon, mm. there is a there is a little uh, museum there about sort of the pilot ships and then the bigger ships that try to get other big ships into the Columbia. It is one of those riveting little 20 minute films you'll see. And I how. have vomited more in Astoria, Oregon than almost Isla Vista, California. And that that takes doing. You got to like lean into it. Uh, no, because I would go there with my grandpa uh, and uh, he had a boat about the size of, of this studio. Um, which fishing is boat, feet which long, is not yeah. not a big boat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I go with my uncle Tom and whatever cousin was lying around, and you know, you drive from from three in the morning uh, from Portland and drive to Astoria. Oh my God, that's a it's, oh, are you kidding it's me? A two and a half, three hour drive. You know who lives out there is uh, Krista Nov Novoselic. Yeah. Um, Astoria is a place that I actually considered like 
getting a little apartment in this crazy building. And then we went up and looked at it. There was a woman that was living like with her cats with this like, like okay. No, no, but uh, the waters there, right there where the, where the rivers are intersecting, there are hundreds of ships underneath that are just doomed. Like you can't, crossing this area, which makes it just the frisson is amazing. Anyway, sorry. Uh, it, it, not that interesting, just that we'd go uh, deep sea fishing or not deep sea, we'd just go uh, ocean, ocean fishing for salmon there, which I'd never catch. But um, you take this tiny little boat going over these huge, huge, like angry Pacific Northwest waves oh, yeah. at the crack of death and you just be yeah. puking up your ass <laughs> no matter what happened. <laughs> Thanks, Grandpa. <laughs> well, your grandpa catches another salmon because he always does. And everybody, of course, had their meat freezer, like their, uh, their game and so salmon freezer. Um, back then, but no, I was uh, thinking about this because uh, Beaverton, so Portland is, which I always called the Valley, by the way. Yeah, which when, makes sense. When I moved to, he's like, hey, we're not in LA anymore, babe. So uh, Portland, it, there's the river stuff on this side, stuff on this side. That's the downtown area, and then there's the big Columbia like this, and then there's hills on this side of the river, right? Um, and uh, and that's where the zoo is, and Omri, whatever the hell Omri was, I never understood. Um, and then once you go over those hills, then you're in the Valley, which is Hillsboro. Yeah and Beaverton and Beaverton. whatnot, you're on the other side of what? Let's see if she can pass the test. The urban growth boundary. Yeah, okay. I, you know, dude, you've got so, that wonkiness that I do not have. I'm but this is actually, I, I think this this um, affects um, the politics of it and the, like, the economic development of it as well, mm -hmm. which is that Portland decided that um, within, and I'm probably getting some of this history wrong. This is teenage brain here. But within the uh, certain boundaries within Portland, maybe the entire city itself, probably more like a subset of the city, um, you wouldn't have extra growth and development. You wouldn't. Oh, that absolutely. Uh, and not only um, not only growth and development, but like verticality, because there was a time in Portland when Portland and I and I talk about and and if I may plug my own article in uh, Reason, it's up online now. It's in the May issue, but it's up online now called "The Dream of the Nineties Died in Portland," and I there was a time when there was a lot of hope in Portland, like, wow, all these people are coming from outside of town. And, you know, the Portlandia was on and there were people coming from other countries and building interesting things. So it was affordable, but it was sexy enough that, okay, am I going to, am I going to like launch my restaurant in San Francisco or I could launch it in Portland, which is sort of kind of it's up and coming. It's up and coming and I could do it for a 10th of the price. So I'm, I'm going to do it. And with that came, came ideas, came art, came desire, and some of it tanked and some of it was incredible, including at one point there were plans that were the old post offices, or it's still there now, it might be gone by now, what do I know? The tallest buildings on the West Coast, which as I put in my one of the pieces I wrote, it was like for a New York City girl, I was like, <laughs> Absolutely. But for Portlanders, it's like, no, 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 no. We do not, we want growth, not that kind of growth. Like they did not want they wanted growth that they still felt comfortable with. And that was, that created some sort of tension, right? It's like, well, I've come here with my like interesting ideas and we want to push these up. Oh, no. And um, in a way, that idea has won. And I don't think it's because native Portlanders wanted that thing. It was the new people that came that, how do I explain this? Can you explain what I'm trying to say? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Well, I don't. So uh, <laughs> no, because uh, the the I mean the the urban growth boundary itself, which probably dates to the 80s or the 90s. Um, this is pre super fancy lad people, but it reflected the normal kind of of West Coast feeling like I don't want the greed heads to overdevelop everything right now. We, we got to slow down and keep it organic and keep it local and, and keep McCormick and Schmitz, Schmitz, whatever oh, it's called. I know. And Powell's I know. and like the things that we love and treasure. We don't want it to, we don't want velocity um, here. Uh, and then I think that that got extra goosed by the new ones who wanted to keep Portland weird. So it's interesting. I actually wound up going to this like really weird, um, lunch at the McCormick and Schmitz, which is, I mean, like, okay, it's like probably not the hippest restaurant in the world, but in Portland, it was like kind of a fancy thing. And I was invited as a part of like a press food thing at one point. And it was like, 
So, and he also owned like the old spaghetti factory. It was the same oh, yeah. family. And the only time I've been to a spaghetti factory was in LA once to meet someone as, a, and as soon as I walked in, someone had vomited right in the yeah. entryway. So my, my only so, association. It's like on Hollywood or Sunset. I exactly. Yeah, my yeah. only association with the spaghetti factory is a big pile of vomit, which, you know, is not the best thing when you're eating. So the, he was like trying to upgrade it to be like super hip because now it was like 2012 and Portland was on the dining scene. And it was just like, it was so it was such a fail and they closed like soon thereafter. I think what I'm trying to say is that um, new old Portlanders and new Portlanders welcomed the growth for a certain amount of time because it was sexy. Of course it was sexy. We wanted it. But then old Portlanders kind of like dipped like whatever. I'm going to keep doing my thing. I'm going to keep like hunting and fishing and tubing. And I got my business over here and my kids in this school. And the new Portlanders were like, yeah, oh, wait until it was like pricing me out of what my little dream was. And so then it was like, well, you're the gentrifier. Oh, you're the person that is making me not be able to open my business. So there was a very strange tension that retarded growth, um, including like this, what I thought was kind of a cool, if weirdly ugly building called the, it was this black, like apartment complex kind of modern that was jutting out over the Willamette by the Burnside Bridge. And um, detractors called it the Death Star. I was like, kind really? Sexy. I mean, it was kind of sexy, but it was like they 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 tried to do it pejoratively. And it's like, well, why? Like, this is someone's idea. Like, embrace it. They didn't want to embrace it. They wanted to embrace whatever their idea with growth was. But they bike lanes. Oh, dead. so many fucking okay. Bike lanes. Wait, wait, so many bike lanes, but not just so many bike lanes. Bike lanes. I, okay, I sat in a meeting with the dude that created this shit. And I was like, okay, so bike lanes usually go on the, the right, right? They're on the right. Hey, Slow hey, lane. It's a car. Right. right? We, 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 the right bike. There's the bikes. Oh, oh, but no, we, they, they put them on the left so that everybody was, okay. So not only, they, they put them on the left and then took away, um, they took away all the parking on that site. And my husband happened to own a business on one of these streets and business, not just for his business, but everybody on the street, which was North Williams um, Avenue was down 50%. Like, hi, you have just robbed me of 50% of my business because people can't park anymore to get a cup of coffee. And we sat with him and this guy that was on the city, uh, one of the city commissioners at the time. And we're like, do you realize what you did? And do you realize that you've put it in an anti-intuitive place? And they said to us, yeah, we know that. And people said that, but we, we just wanted to try something new. We're like, yeah, but it's a bad idea. And you're putting us out of business. And there was at one point, got a little pushback for this. There was one vehicular bicycle death a week in Portland. God. I mean, like you're because people, big time for that. people don't know how to do this. It's like, <laughs> I always know that it's on the right. Which would have made, anyway, Portland made a lot of, I'm going to be generous here. They made decisions that they tried to be new and tried to be inventive. And I appreciate this. I, I, I welcome this. But then when it was proved to be wrong, they didn't want to back away from it. And then we can get into whatever stuff going forward. But let's go back. Let's go back to Grandpa Welch because Always he was awesome. go back to Pappy. He was awesome. It's drywall business and whatever. Yeah. And the um, truck, he, he didn't he ditch his truck one time and then like... Uh, he did drive... He, he, but didn't he like pick it up himself? Like he picked up the whole truck? I don't want to... I don't want to either mythologize or, or like do Pappy uh, wrong. Uh, when I was moving my dad out of uh, his house last fall, uh, we came upon all kinds of like uh, ancient texts, <laughs> some Dead Sea Scrolls of the Welch family. <laughs> and one of them is my grandma, who's like the the saintiest woman you've ever met. With the met. best name ever. Aleph Viola Sherry. Viola was, Sherry? Was her oh maiden my God. Name. Came from a troubled family in Craig, Colorado. Um, and, uh, but, uh, and wore like pigtails well into her seventies and would my mom too. And uh, actually not uh, dissimilar to your mom, um, a little bit more, uh, Rocky mountain, uh, vibe, but, uh, but you know, she always, she always say it to me like hands in boiling water for you, young lassie or lad. Laddie. I wouldn't call me laddie. She would call me laddie. I wasn't quite a lassie. Um, 
But uh, uh, anyways, uh, I would see her notes like uh, talking about all the different um, numbers of Percocets that Pappy would put. Oh, I remember that you posted that. <laughs> I put in his lunch pail as he was going to work to lay drywall. Percocets. You know, well, Pappy was in pain. Well, he got hit. The family lore is that he was driving his truck and um, some like entire swarm of bees came into his in his uh, cabin and he hi it's oregon and he drove down right. in yeah and in the summer in oregon is just berry season all the all the great blueberry pies uh, can i tell you my joke yeah my joke yeah. how do you know someone's new to oregon uh -oh. they're happy to see blackberries and mint in their backyard this is not a funny joke no it's but, it's, but it's do not, you get it do not, you do you understand the joke it's not funny okay look they're invasive plants okay guys that's the joke <laughs> right they're invasive plants you're never going to kill Whoa. them your entire Whoa. house is going to bust a rib here your entire <laughs> house is going to be covered in blackberry vines and mint like you cannot make enough mojitos to use up that mint so. um alpine strawberries though that's beautiful and mushrooms i've gone out mushroom hunting uh i've written about mushroom hunting i've gone truffle hunting i've eaten those things they're very good but they're they're super Oh my God, that stuff is crazy. Mm -hmm. You will like eat them and be like. <laughs> the politics of low and, and, and like managed growth become eventually over time, they metastasize into, and they're almost always done at the beginning for super good lefty reasons. And I, and I know this um, because I went to school in Santa Barbara and started doing journalism at the college newspaper there. And there was this befuddlement, like, how is it that Santa Barbara has all these old hippies, like who burned down the bank in 1970 and, and did this and did that and have all these values. And yet Santa Barbara is one of the richest places to live. Like I think the median a home price in Santa Barbara cracked north of, of $1 million in the nineties. Holy man. Like it was incredible. Well, um, they too had a no growth thing. They had a, any new thing had to be like, you know, it was a convoluted water board meeting. The Galita Valley water board was like the most was important like, water board. What? <laughs> because okay, water okay. is used yeah, yeah, for yeah. each thing. And, and Santa Barbara actually has, uh, unlike uh, Portland has actually scarce water because of the geography of the place all depends on. And you do know the water bills in Portland were insane, insane, but like the water so delicious. Most no, delicious no, no. tap. What? I what? Sorry. No. I am a New York City girl. When wow. when I was a little kid and we used to like go away for the weekend, I would like make my mother make me bottles of New York City water, which you. has this like slight metallic yeah. taste. Oh, oh yes. The, straight from the Guanas Canal. Don't listen to Matt Walsh. Well, listen to me. All lies. But uh I think I think it it helps create exactly the politics that our friend uh, Jeffrey Sinclair uh uh claims to despise like it, it it's when you create scarcity you can't build stuff right. what happens right. wow it's really hard to live there and the prices go up and the for the people who like who bought in who bought that house for eighteen thousand dollars in 1971 on state street in santa barbara or wherever the hell in portland or in los angeles uh san francisco which is its own kind of uh, uh interesting scarcity Fecal issue household. there well, I mean, they're just, it's also just such a small geographic footprint yeah. there, but every one of these uh, cities has come up with something that's like that, or a set of processes that end up becoming that. And what happens? The median price goes up like this. And so the, the, the kind of Levittowns that were, that sprung up in the fifties in all these places, like the, like the around Northeast Fargo, right? That these were just like big fields plunk down a house in the middle of it and then you'd start building on it as you got wealthier. Um, and also where I grew up in, in Long Beach and in Lakewood, um, cheap housing everywhere just sort of sprung up. It's like you get a Sears house or a Craftsman house yep. or or whatever. There's, you know, tracked homes. There's only three different blueprints. Those Sears houses are kind of cool actually. Great. Right? <laughs> I mean, Palm Springs is the best example uh, of like how cool you can get with yeah. a cookie cutter house. Right, like unbelievably, really, really cool little neighborhoods, and add some outdoor space. Just put a like pad or what? Like a they? weird like a yeah. A frame uh, yeah. on the on the garage. Um, but like, where do you get that in the greater Portland area? You get that in Beaverton. You get that in Hillsboro. You get it in, maybe in Gresham, uh, less so now. But you get it outside of the urban growth boundary. But but aesthetically, you don't get the people out there doing that, right? Exactly. You've got like the people that want to do that. Like I have a lot. Of, I got a one friend. I'm I'm forgetting her name right now. She's a really good photographer. She, she like Wall Street Journal and other stuff. And she built. They call it what did they call it a. Uh, 
ADA or additional housing thing that you, they passed something in Portland that like, if you had a garage, you could turn it into an additional housing unit, ADU, which is great. And we actually, when we still lived there, we're like, we, we had a complete separate garage that, you know, my husband kept his car in and some tools and stuff. But if we wanted to, we could have like turned it into a uh, little hobo, hobo shack. Yeah. Well, or nicer, actually. I yeah. mean, it, it, it had a bigger footprint than where we are right now. And you could have made it uh, into an Airbnb, which this gal did that I know. Um, and so the people that have the ideas to go out and like do the A-frame in Beaverton, they don't want to be in Beaverton. They want to be in Portland yes. because there's the concept that stuff is happening here in Portland. And a lot of people did. And then ga -ga -ga -ga, two years ago, three years ago, Portland City Council and progressivism is like, no, you can't do that anymore. We don't want you to do that. You can't do this anymore. And you can only rent to X, Y, and Z people. It really became a way to retard not just physical growth, but conceptual and artistic growth, which is the stuff that drives me bananas. It's like, okay, if you were going to put an 80, two 81 story skyscrapers where the old post office was, which, as I said, made my heart go pitter pat, be super interesting, and you're not going to do that, that's fine. Okay, I get it. It's it's conceptually a little too much. But you are now telling people that are going to put their own money and time into building something kind of cool for other people to come and enjoy Portland, you can't do that anymore? That really bums me out. Yeah, and, like, and the culture that you talk about, and there's a good section in there about food, I mean, uh, Portland was kind of like the the leading edge of, of food culture in in America for a while. There's certainly beer and microbrewing. It absolutely set the pace. Um, and then for all kinds of food trucks and and like homemade cocktails. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to enter I'm sorry. Yeah, like, yeah. I have you, a lot to say about, about this. Okay. So I wrote for Bon Appetit for 10 years from like 1990 seven till 2007. Like I had, I had an investment in food. I wrote a food column for the city magazine in Portland. And like, I knew a lot of chefs. I knew a lot of people that had a lot of ideas and God, good food. People are the most generous people in the world. They're creative. They want to feed you. Like what is better than someone wanting to put food in your mouth? Why is my sub stack called make more pie? Like you want to feed people. You want to include them. We want to have a conversation about this stuff. And they came to Portland in droves because they could afford it. They'd been at like the French laundry in, uh, in, in um, Napa Valley. My, my very dear friend, Troy McClarty, who opened my favorite restaurant ever um, in Portland, lovely hula hands. And now he's got his own stuff in there. And other people that came from other parts of the country and said, Wow, Portland, you're so amazing. Like you're a breadbasket. We've got wine, we got vegetables. People are making vodka. They're like making peanut butter. Like I want to stake a claim here and give it to the world. And it completely worked. It completely worked because it should have worked. It wasn't spin. It wasn't bullshit. It was people with their, I, I wrote once in an article that if Portlanders could make their own water, they would have made their own water. My husband was a coffee roaster. He went and like bought coffee beans for people in El Salvador and came and like lovingly roasted them to give it to the community. It was a place that had that sort of sexiness and it was sexy. It was seriously legit sexy from about 2007 to maybe 2013. And then like milk, it curdled. <laughs> this thing started happening where people of course, there's envy and jealousy and whatever, and the world continues to turn. I get it. But people started getting mad that, I mean, it seems to me they were getting mad that you had a certain success that they didn't. It could be more complicated than that. But it's really kind of sad because, and I'm not saying Portland doesn't still have this. Portland still has great craft people making honey and booze and you should totally it's just built into it, it is. has it's, always been part of that culture it's people that work with their hands okay like literally like people that just come and say like okay i'm gonna pull up my my overalls here now i'm gonna make something for you with my hands this is love this is love and portland really had that for a while which was a beautiful thing it's been i'm sure it still exists there and, I, and i'm sorry if i'm not covering in that properly and maybe I will. Maybe I'll go back and try to figure out the people that are still doing that in Portland. But there has been a different narrative happening in Portland, which I've been covering, which is um, uh, people that don't want you to make the crafts that you make because they feel that you're not the person to make it. I so. mean, to use your go-to metaphor of the pie, 
Right. Um, there's always the question, and we talk about this in terms of media, which is what we, you and I usually talk about when we're experimenting with, you know, stanky art or whatever you were doing. <laughs> and we, I actually, I'm going to tell you something right now. There have been no questions, which makes me think that it's not actually streaming yeah. on YouTube. So this you know could what? be, it's like, a lost episode. We're happy. We love being here. We with recorded you. it, uh, Evening, you know, no um, on the, um, on the, oh, we got the little, little chip, the little chip. Um, but, um, no, when, when the pie stops growing, what do the fights become about? It becomes about entitlement, dividing up the pie. And I, I've never believed that. I mean, we, we, I, I think probably even before we met, we've met, 18, we don't remember meeting, but it was like 18 years ago or something. And someone Sorry. had said to me, it was Kathy Sipes' sister and something like, well, I can't talk about this and that because there's, a, I was like, no, it's not about getting more slices out of the pie. It's about making more pie. Just make another pie. Oh my God, it's so fun. So say, I might film myself making pie tomorrow. You should. Before I get my second shot. Oh, when is that? Is that tomorrow? Tomorrow. And then can you please tell us what happened to you? Because I'm looking forward to that. Like I'm looking forward to something that more than anything. I got my second vax on Saturday and super happy, obviously. And um, and it's fine. And uh, and I walked out of there uh, doing like singing in the rain kind of dances and stuff clicking of the heels a lot of clouds just like i i suddenly was was light on my feet it was great um and i went home and hanging out with my family i was like about 90 minutes later i then went into a just like papa needed to get the horizontal for a long time so yeah for the next uh 24 hours i probably slept 15 to 17 of them so I remember because we were I was try trying to communicate with you. I was like, Matt, Matt, <laughs> nothing going on. So I'm getting my shot at 115. And then I'm doing a podcast with Michael Totten and the Colette folks at 330. And then I plan on like literally like eating some food and going to sleep for 15 hours. And just piecing out. I, my I re am recommendation, so excited. get a little like sugar hit or like some coffee or whatever pasta. a big giant bowl of just pasta. like get you through the michael totten and then i am going to be so don't contact me i'm going to be sleeping i mean i hope i'm i i don't sleep enough desperate for 15 hours of sleep i'll be so happy um so. i wanted to make sure that we talked about here before we That's clock right. out of our usual like 40 to 45 minutes which is what have we been doing where are we or is there a thingy 36 oh cool Look. Right. um so Here's the thing. We've been talking about Portland. Yes. Nancy has, as most of you by now uh, realize, has done or some- should Or should realize. Has done a lot of great work about Portland over the last couple of years. Did before as well, but like in this vein of the weird stuff that's happening in Portland, stuff that happened in her uh, personal life, just like crazy Portland stuff, um, including during the, the high water mark of the protests and things like that, she wrote, 15 pieces for reason. This last uh, essay is kind of like the culmination or the synthesis of it in some ways. There's been, I'm just talking to you. Do you don't mind? No, uh, I, it's uh, absolutely true. Everything uh, you said is right. Uh, yes. I've written pe a great piece for tablets uh, called something like Farewell Portland or whatever. Well, I'm actually, it was called Good Luck Portland, which luck. you actually named, but they wound up calling it Portlandization. It could happen to a city near you. Good Luck Portland is much better. It's so much better. And and actually, in the URL, it's called Good Luck Portland. Um, but yeah, I did write four, 14 pieces for reason about the protests or whatever you want to call them. In, in, uh, and Catherine and I talked about that a lot today in a in something that's actually not live for the rest of use but um and then the little kind of capstone um that i put today but continue tell them tell them so, what's happening um the her going to portland and writing about the protests were was at least partially a result of uh nancy and i and jacob siegel the great jacob siegel, Jake siegel saying nancy with the look fuck? nancy Na we're sitting at matt's <laughs> it was last july we would had like 1400 cocktails mm -hmm. and it was just the three of us sitting at your pic picnic table and jake who is one of the best writers going period he writes for tablet mag and he's on staff at tablet mag he's like nancy the fuck is going on in portland and then you turned to me and said you got to get out there and then the next morning at 8 30 i texted Catherine mango ward who's the editor chief of reason and said i i want to go to portland for you and she said go like literally go and i was on a plane that day and um filed 14 stories over the next couple of months 
capstone article published on Monday. It's in the May issue. And then, and I'll let you uh, riff on this, but I decided that on Monday I'm going to Minneapolis. Yes. So uh, you'll talk a little bit about the what's happening in Minneapolis this week, but just to kind of flesh out precisely the uh, the value proposition here. Um, when we were sitting around with Jake Siegel and saying, you know, that's when all hell was breaking loose in Portland. And, and the rest of the country. I mean, it was. It's know, true. But like Portland, Portland yeah. and Minneapolis yes. actually were, yes. the, were the two real epicenters of a bunch of New York as well. But like there's a sense of, gosh, I wish we we had someone that we could trust writing about this because right. for a variety of reasons that Nancy has actually covered, um, you can't sadly trust the local news uh, that much. A, a part of it is not. I mean, it's partly the no local news's fault, but the local activists can run a pretty heavy hand on that. We won't go down that rabbit hole just now, but like, um, it's just hard the, in the world that we live in, in the media world, you don't have that sense, a uh, wider a sense of, of trust. Like, Hey, if the Washington post airlifts somebody there, are we going to be able to trust it? I just don't have that as much anymore. And so there's this great feeling of relief for those of us who knew Nancy that she was going to go and write that. Um, a lot of people, including hopefully a lot of you who've been uh, watching and listening to this, might have met Nancy through that process and thought, oh, hey, that's great. I can like relate to this and trust the content. Doesn't mean it's 100% perfect or 100% anything, but just like you know that it's not from someone who's dealing in some other type of agenda. She's going to like go and where the story goes and it's going to be entertaining and enlightening. Well, she's doing the same thing in Minneapolis where the trial is happening now yes. over George Floyd. Talk about it. So uh, the, the the trial for uh, uh, Derek Chauvin, uh, the officer that killed uh, George Floyd, starts on Monday. But weirdly, I didn't even know that. I mean, I, obviously, I knew that this was unrolling. They were trying to pick the jurors. Um, but I found out after I decided to go to Minneapolis that um, it starts on Monday. So I'm going to be staying downtown right near the courthouse. I I don't think I'm going to go be going into the courthouse. I mean, I might. That's not my agenda. My agenda is to go in there and um, find out what's going on on the ground, what people are thinking, maybe go to the, I thought it was called the Autonomous Zone, but a friend of mine who works for the um, Star Tribune said, well, it's not called that. It's called the George Floyd I, I don't remember. She just texted me a little while ago. Um, I also want to find, I've got like a lot of native friends in, in uh, Minneapolis because my daughters had native, like the sort of what they call, oh my God, I'm going to get skewered for this, but they call it this themselves like the moccasin mafia. Like they can, pretty good. I, I, I didn't make that up. <laughs> That's what they call it. Like try to find out like, especially maybe what, what native folks are feeling there, pro, anti, whatever. I'm just going to hit the ground for five days. Uh, another friend of mine, who I'm not going to mention right now, is going to be in town, other journalist. And um, just try to take the temperature of what's going on, which is the only thing I've tried to do for a reason. And it's worked out really well. I mean, I hope it works out next week. It could be a total bust and you never see any articles at all. But I don't think so. I think that if you show up trying to really listen to people and um, then – uh, I might be able to offer you guys something good and toward that end. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me you, you actually it up, dude. <laughs> make a pitch here. Make pitch. So Nancy is a freelancer. I am beings. a freelancer. A freelancer. When she went to Portland, a town, which of course she has a lot of business I process do. of and selling houses and, and connection, things like that. She had reason to go to Portland. In addition to that, Minneapolis, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, for one would love to have, reporting that I could trust from Minneapolis in addition to reports from debauchery with fifth column listeners who happen to uh, be listening from the greater Minneapolis area. Also very valuable, but uh, most importantly, just that, like um, if, you know, if hell, hell breaks loose or if, or if not, or if whatever, if the city comes with a reckoning of the kind of uh, damage that happened, the police relations that went uh, haywire, uh, last summer, um, there's not many people uh, in the world who I would trust to do the reporting from there. Nancy is on the very, very short list. So to that effect, as a freelancer, she has a little Venmo. You go to Nancy Rom on the Twitter and like you can have the thrill of helping bankroll this broad so that she can go to reporting. Um, and like part of it for me, honestly, is that I would like there to be 
um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and actually Jenna Libertarian had a, a really good piece about this today about the economics of Substack and what that all that all mm -hmm. means going forward. Believe it or not, the Substack discourse produced a, at least a tiny little bit more a thing that's uh, of interest, not just to media navel gazers, but like um, uh, there's an open question of does whatever new model that we're going to in the world uh, pay for actual reporting and journalism? Um, I think, uh, of course, it will. Uh, not just you know beautiful uh, commentary. Oh, I think it will. Um, but le I would like to, I would like to create demonstration projects uh, or leak cheer on demonstration projects for that happening. So get in there, give this broad some money for airfare and hotel. Give She's me going some anyways. Some money. I already bought my stuff. All right. So listen, demonstration projects. We all know that this is happening. I mean, we Matt in the fifth column. It exists, and so. Yes, I am freelance. I, you know, I don't have a big crew coming with me. I'm super sorry. I'm going to try to get better. Like, uh, I'm going to try to balance my camera a little better so that when I take like little videos for you, you're like, Nancy, you're nauseating me. I will do a better job. But yeah, like I don't have a big crew working with me. I never have. That's fine. If you want to, I've got a sub stack. You can go Nancy Vom on the sub stack. You'll find it. You can subscribe or on my Twitter page. I put my Venmo if you want to hit it. That'd be great. It'll help me out. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so obviously you don't have to, but it would be fun and sort of inclusive to know that we're all we're all doing this. And um, you can help make journalism of the type that you appreciate happen. That's be because they're better. They're there are worse things in the world. Let's guys, say. I mean, I think, you know, who was I talking to today? Um, oh, actually, someone that was pretty. Oh, actually, it was my chiropractor. I got like a, I ran something in my back and he was sort of a super liberal guy in New York City. I go and get my like work done there. And he told me, I told him, I'm a journalist. I'm doing some ways. He's like, you know what? I did not vote this year and I can't watch Fox or NBC, MSNBC or CNN. I can't trust anybody anymore. And I was like, oh, I have a solution for you. <laughs> I was like, told him I'd even like buy him a subscription to Reason Magazine or he can, you can watch what I'm trying to do. Is it going to be like the definitive word on anything? No, but I'll try to give it to you straight. Like I, I promise you that I will do that, which I've done before. Go read the Reason stuff and um, you might like it. And um, that's it. That's it. Here's hoping that this uh, broadcast out, we don't have any proof. We have no idea. We, we could have been doing nothing right now. Um, so, um, but at least we recorded some audio, but if we record video as well, Awesome and sorry about my hair. Oh, his hair's awesome. Okay. Where's the you know, I have no I have a bad finger. End broadcast. And and